In this video tutorial, we'll go through all of the basic steps necessary to analyze a truss by graphic statics. This tutorial is going to be a, a single one panel truss, but the steps that we go through are the same for any truss, no matter how many panels, how complex the loading is. The first thing we do is start with the form diagram. So this is our form diagram. It does not need to be drawn to any particular scale, however the uh, proportions do need to be correct. That's because we're going to use this as the basis for our force polygon. So this example, the one panel truss, has an 11 foot span, has a 10 kip load that is slightly off center, and a height of 4 feet. The rise of the truss is 4 feet. So we begin by finding our reactions. We have a potential left and right hand reaction vertically, also potentially horizontal because on the left hand side we have a pin connection. However, there is no horizontally acting force on this truss, therefore there can be no horizontal reaction. However, if we did push horizontally on the truss, this is where it would occur. So we'll label this our left and our right. Using our basic equations of static equilibrium, some of the forces vertically equal to zero, and we'll use the same convention that your book uses, that downward is positive. So we have a 10 kip force minus our right, because that we're assuming that's going upward. Oops, meant to make that our left. And our right, all equals zero. Or in other words, our left plus our right equal to 10 kips. Not an equation that we can solve at this point because we have two unknowns in one equation. So now we have to introduce our moment equation. Now again, we make an assumption for which direction we're calling positive. Again, we'll do as the book does, calling clockwise moments positive. And we need to tell which point we're summing moments about. In this case, we'll take the left hand end. So moments on the left equal to zero. We could do it on the right hand end, it doesn't matter. What we do want to do though is select a moment sum center that will eliminate one of the unknowns. By summing moments about the left hand side, the moment arm for the reaction on the left hand side passes through the moment center, therefore the moment about that point is zero, leaving us with one unknown. And we can solve that equation. So summing moments about the left hand end, we have 10 kips at a distance of 7 feet. With respect to the left hand end, it has a tendency to rotate in the clockwise direction, therefore we call that positive. And then we have our right. Its moment arm is 11 feet. With respect to the left hand end, it tends to rotate counterclockwise, therefore negative. And with respect to the left hand end, those are the only two forces that act to rotate the system. So they balance out to zero. Giving us a direct solution for our right is equal to 10 kips times 7 feet divided by 11 feet equals 6.36 kips. Our left, going back to our previous equation, says that our left is 10 kips minus our right. Or 6.36 kips. So our right, excuse me, our left 
is 3.64 kips. And so we'll put this back onto our form diagram. 6.36 kips on the right hand side, 3.64 on the left hand side. So that really is completing step one. We've indicated all the loads in the reactions. Next we want to label the form diagram around the perimeter with capital letters in the intervals between each load and reaction. That means the spaces between them. And then we label each interior panel with a number. So the space between the left-hand reaction and the 10 kip force is one region, and we call that region A. And then between the 10 kip load and the uh, right-hand reaction, we'll label that B. And then lastly, we have between the right-hand reaction and the left-hand reaction, we call that space C. We can label this in any order we choose. We can also label this A, B, and C, or A, B, C. It really doesn't matter how we do it. We only have one interior panel. We label that point one. Now, from the form diagram, we're going to com uh, complete our force polygon starting with the load line, and that will be in the second video. Now that we have completed our um, analysis of the truss and set up the form diagram, we're ready to do the force polygon. We want to choose a convenient scale that will be easily measured that's large enough that will give us a reasonably accurate result and not so large that it'll go off our page. The degree of accuracy that we can get out of our diagram is directly proportional to the accuracy that we can draw the diagram. So we don't want to make it too small. On a page this size, 8.5 by 11 horizontally, a scale of about 1 to 30 on an engineering scale works out fairly well for the size of a truss. An engineering scale will let us read the force values directly off of the scale without having to convert from feet and inches if we used an architectural scale. And it doesn't matter whether our forces are in kips or in newtons, whether we're using, in other words, SI units or uh, US customary units. The scale is just a proportional measure, so it can be an engineering scale. It could also be a, me a metric scale if we wanted to. So we'll set this at 1 to 30. In other words, 1 inch is going to be 30 kips. So here's 1 inch. These are quarter inch squares. So that would read 30 kips. Or just for a reminder, oops, I said 30 kips, that's 3 kips, 1 inch is 3 kips. As a reminder, we'll say 1 to 30 is our scale. We begin by drawing our load line. Load line is all of the external forces on the structure. We have a 10 kip applied load. And we have a reaction of about 6.4 kips on the right, 3.6 kips on the left. Now you may wonder, you know, what scale do I need to draw this at? Is 1 to 30 always good? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, sometimes you have to experiment to see what fits. And you might just want to try it, just scratch it out very uh, briefly on a separate sheet of paper before you transfer it to your final drawing. If there's a little bit of trial and error that goes with it. So I'm going to measure down here to distance 10. That, that's what's nice about the engineering scale. I can read that's 10 kips directly. Because this is our initial force, it starts with A and goes to B because we've labeled it force AB. And we'll indicate that on our diagram. 
and then connect those two lines. Notice that I'm using a separate uh, straight edge for drawing the lines. I don't like to draw right up against the edge of the scale because we can nick that and wear off the graduations and it'll be less accurate. I like these little plastic see-through rulers because it's easy to align things. You can get them in different dimensions. Uh, you can get them 12 inches, 18 inches, this little 6 inch one. This is in um, 16th of an inch divisions or 8th inches on the big squares. You can get them in metric as well. So we go up about 6.4 kips. Now here's our accuracy. We can't, we can't be any more exact than what we can read on our scale. So here's 6, this would be 7. Here's 6.5, 6.4, 6.3. So 6.36 is right in between those two. And the width of the lead here is already about 50 pounds on this scale, so we, we just can't be any more accurate than this. Try to get it as close as possible. So this force is labeled BC. B to C. That represents our reaction, 6.4. So this dimension here is our 6.36 kips, which is all right. Then the last dimension, this is already figured out for us by locating point C, but we'll just check and make sure we've got it close. It should scale to 3.64. So here's 2, 3, 3.5, 3.6. About as close as I can get that. So that dimension is the left-hand reaction. And of course, overall, the whole thing is 10 kips, which is the applied load. Now we can begin to construct the actual force polygon by transferring lines. What we know is that the line here is a vector direction. And here's where our labeling comes in. We label each line by the letter and number that bounds it. So this line here, that member, is called A1. What that means on our force polygon is that it is a line that passes through points A and 1. So we have point A, what we don't have is point 1. All we can do at this point is transfer a parallel line, and this is where the rolling ruler is very handy. Draw a line through A at the same inclination, and that's all we know. One, point 1 lies somewhere along this line. Similarly for B1, I take that line, draw a transfer line parallel that passes through B. Now I've determined point 1 because this is called B1, this is called A1. Both B1 and A1 share point 1 in common. So if B1 and A1 intersect at 1, then this has to be point 1. Lastly, we have point C1, our vector C1, horizontal line. And we can see I'm slightly off on my measurements here. We'll just kind of go in between the two of them and get as close as we can. But it's fairly close. C1 also intersects at that point. This is our force polygon. This will always be a closed structure. The load line always returns back to where you start. And however complex that is, when you start to do loads that are inclined or horizontal, this won't be just a straight vertical line. It'll start to go out sideways 
it'll go at angles, but it always goes back to the same point in the beginning where you started. So again, this is called our force polygon. And it's more correctly labeled with the scale below it. One inches three kips. This is also known as a Maxwell diagram. That's in honor of James Clerk Maxwell, the brilliant scientist who uh, developed this technique. That's Maxwell of Maxwell's equations you might have heard of in physics, a uh, very famous 19th century scientist. This is basically complete. Now we're ready to interpret it. The magnitude of any of these vectors is directly read at the same scale that we drew it. So the magnitude of the force in A1 we read that from our scale is about 6, 7.5, 7.4. That's about 7.4 kips. And that's really about as accurate as I can get that at this scale. If I double the scale, I can be more accurate. The magnitude of the force in the horizontal member, C1, looks like that's about 6. 3, 6. Let's call it 6.4 kips. And then B1 has a magnitude of just about 9 kips. Now the last step is to interpret the sense of the force is here, and that will be shown in the next video. Now that we've completed the force polygon and have uh, now that we've completed the force polygon and determined the magnitude of the forces in it, the last thing is to actually read the sense of those forces. This goes back to our naming convention that we set up initially. This is an area that beginning students with this have a little bit of difficulty sometimes, so be very careful about explaining this. Any joint is labeled by the letters and numbers that surround it, read in a clockwise order. That's very important. It has to be in a clockwise order. So the joint at the lower left here would be identified as A1C. We could also call it 1CA or CA1. What we can't do is call it C1A or anything reading in a counterclockwise direction. Similarly, the joint at the top would be B1A, AB1, or 1AB. That's very important because when we come to the reading the sense of the members framing into that joint, we use the same type of designation for the member names. In other words, member A1 at the lower left-hand end is called A1 because when we read the joint name, the A comes before the 1 when we go across the joint. However, when we look at the upper joint at the very top, that same member is now called 1A because in a clockwise reading of the joint name, 1 comes before A. We transfer that to the force polygon. So this member we're interested in here, when we're looking at the lower left-hand joint, and it's always with respect to a joint that we understand these forces, we label this member A1. If we imagine ourselves to be a mouse moving from 
a to 1 running along this line, we would go from a down to 1 in a direction from the upper right to the lower left. If instead we are at the upper right hand joint, we would go from 1 to a in this direction, heading towards a. In either case, the force is pointing towards the joint. And this end is pointing down towards the joint. Anytime our forces go towards a joint, it's a compression force. So we read the 7.4 kips as compression. And we'll transfer that to our force, our form diagram. The horizontal member on the bottom, again if we start at the left hand end, the name is 1C. So if we go from 1 to C, we're moving from the left to the right, away from the joint. It's labeled 1C because in a clockwise reading across that member, 1 comes before C. On the right hand side, we would call it C1 because again in a clockwise reading across the member the C comes before 1 therefore it's moving from the right to the left again pulling away from the joint we always look at the joints therefore the 6.4 kips is tension lastly we have our sloping member B1 or 1B. If we look at the very top joint, it would be labeled B1. Going from B to 1, going from the lower right to the upper left. Therefore, it's pushing towards the joint, meaning that would be compression. And that's confirmed by looking at the lower right hand joint. It would be labeled 1B. We go from 1 to B, we move upper left to lower right, therefore this is 9 kips compression. And that completes our analysis of the truss. And the same procedure, no matter how complex a system we have, it's always the same step-by-step -step procedure. Each one of these smaller triangular segments, in this case triangular, represents the equilibrium of any one joint. If we look at the lower left-hand joint, we'd see that it's bounded by the horizontal, or the horizontal line on the bottom and the sloping line here, and a force here. In other words, we look at that joint, we have a vertical reaction of about 3.6 kips. We have a sloping force of 7.4 kips and a horizontal force 6.4 kips. And we can see that Another way to draw this equilibrium triangle looks like this. 3.6, 7.4, 6.4, which is exactly what we have here. So each triangle represents the equilibrium of any joint, as well as the entire system. So 10 kip force and the two reactions comprise this entire side. That completes our analysis.